Morning to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter number 7 and verse 1. Matthew 7, 1. Now this is Levi the publican. And we have what's called the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount lays the foundation for the kingdom of heaven on earth. And it's a wonderful thing. If you haven't read it lately, you ought to read it and go back through it and study it, the Sermon on the Mount. And keep in mind that it lays down the constitution, if you please, the law of the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven on earth. Chapter number 7 and verse 1, Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Ninety-nine percent of the time that this scripture is read, it stops there. And most of the people out here on the street, that's the one scripture that they know and they use. Believe me, they'll use it on you. Judge not that you be not judged. But we're not stopping there. Look at verse 6. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. Father, bless your holy word this morning. In thy name I pray, amen. You can be seated. The Lord Jesus Christ said some things that commentators have a hard time dealing with. For example, when he told the Syrophoenician woman, it's not good to take the meat of the children and give it to dogs. In other places where he said, sell your script and buy a sword. It's one other place where he said, go not to the, uh, into the Gentiles, but only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then here's one where it says that you do not take that which is holy and give it to the dogs and cast not your pearls before swine. Now, right before that, in the context, it says, judge not that you be not judged. So obviously there's something has to take place if you didn't know what a dog and a swine is, right? You certainly do. And when it comes to comes to sinners, uh, sinners' greatest friend is the Lord Jesus Christ. No question about that. He's the friend of sinners. And sin is categorized in the Bible. Not to say that you're condemned more for one than the other, but it is categorized. It falls under different categories. And here we find in the book of Matthew chapter number 7 that we have a category where we have dogs and swine. Or as another man said it, dogs and hogs. That's what we've got here in verse number 6. Now, I want you to look carefully at this, and I want you to think about what I'm going to be preaching to you this morning, and let it sink in. How many's ever heard of J. Harold Smith? J. Harold Smith was a wonderful man of God. I loved him dearly. We had him here at the church a few years ago. Well, he had a message called God's Three Deadlines, and he was famous for that. It's just like the one that R.G. Lee had, uh, Payday Someday, uh, when he was pastoring the church in Memphis, Tennessee. God's three deadlines, according to J. Harold Smith, and according to the Bible, are these. You sent away your day of grace. You find that in Luke chapter number 12 and verse 20, where the Lord said, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of, of thee. Obviously, he had planned for the next day and the next day and the next day. He laid up his stores, and but he was unprepared for his own soul to leave this world. That's sinning away the day of grace. Then Brother Smith mentions the sin unto death that we find in 1 Corinthians 5. Verse 5, a man had his father's wife. The Apostle Paul said, Turn such an one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved. So we have here a sin unto death. The Apostle John mentions it. In 1 John chapter 5, he said, If you see a brother sinning a sin unto death. 
Now we have under, we understand by studying the Bible that there is not necessarily any one particular sin that is the sin unto death. It is a state of mind and a state of the heart in rebellion against God that leads to the sin unto death. And then finally, Brother Smith mentions the unpardonable sin. Matthew chapter number 12 and verse number 32, where the Lord said, There is no forgiveness. That's tough stuff. If you've done something and there is no forgiveness for it. Here again, we find an individual that comes into a state of thinking and a state of their heart. Not individual, not necessarily any one individual sin, but it's a place that they arrive at. And here we find in 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, if you'd like to turn there, and verse number 9, the Apostle Paul gives us a list of... And this is a pretty, uh, it's a pretty full list of the sins that are involved with humanity. First Corinthians chapter sin, verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And you might want to add, first, according to the book of Acts, the apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus, was a murderer. But he got forgiveness, did he not? In plainer words, all of these sins that I read to you, he says to them in verse number 11, And such were some of you, but ye are washed. Ye are sanctified, and ye are justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. Amen. That's something to rejoice over, is the fact that even though he has this comprehensive list of all of the sins of mankind, it just about covers all of the nuances of the sins involved, that there is forgiveness in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I could say, as the scripture says, that in this house this morning, we probably have about every one of these sins covered in one fashion or another. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 6 and verse number 9, he talks about a feminine. That is a catamite. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6 and verse 9, he talks about abusers of themselves with mankind. That is a sodomite. And you're living in an age that has been unknown in America before this age. So you need to be careful. You need to watch what's going on around you and seek the face of God. Remember, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses from all sin. When a sinner brings that before Christ, there is forgiveness for it. But keep in mind, something can happen to the soul and to the state, to the heart, to the being of that individual where he no longer desires to bring that sin before God and get forgiveness for it. And we'll find that here in just a moment. But thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift. For you've been washed, the Bible says. You've been sanctified and justified. You are washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation 1.5 You are sanctified. And that is the setting aside of the Holy Spirit when He seals you until the day of redemption. And then you've been justified as if you had never done it. You are now a son of God by the new birth in the Lord Jesus Christ. A lot to be thankful for there. So the clarification of sinners continues. Note carefully. In the book of Matthew chapter number 7 and verse number 6. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs. Neither cast ye your pearls before swine. What are we talking about here? I would like to know what it is to be what the holy that he's talking about him and the uh, and that which is uh, that which is holy and and then uh, your pearls he's talking about in first Corinthians I mean in Matthew chapter number 7 and verse number 6 keep that in mind and pray over that as we move along through the message this morning the apostle peter said in second peter chapter number 2 and verse 22 he talks about the dog that has turned to its vomit and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. The Bible talks about the dogs in Philippians chapter number 3 and verse number 2. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. First, uh, Philippians 3.18 For as many walk as I've told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. 
Now my friend, this is a state of being. This is a mind attitude. This is a heart attitude. When you become an enemy of the cross of Christ, when you become a God hater, amen. In other words, once you reach that stage, you are on the precipice of going the step too far. And once you take that step, there is no return. Once you cross that line, there is nowhere to go back to. We live in a time when you preach and nobody repents. We live in a time when men love each other and they're taught to love each other. And it comes from their pulpits and they get a daily dose of it. There is no more repentance preached in the churches today. All over this country, people do not know. And if you preach repentance, you get vilified for it. Well, my dear friend, the Lord Jesus said, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Dogs in the Bible are filthy and unclean. According to Proverbs chapter 26 and verse 11. Bear in mind, we're not talking about that little pooch you've got at home that's your little favorite dog. That's your friend. That's not what we're talking about. In the Bible, when it talks about dogs, it talks about these scavengers that roamed through the cities 2,000 years ago that would eat the dead, would find whatever they could. They come, would become vicious they would attack you they growl at you and therefore they had become an unclean in the sight of all men this is what the Bible's talking about when it talks about dogs Psalm 22 verse 16 dogs have compassed me the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me they pierced my hands and my feet that's very instructive for the Lord Jesus said while he was on the cross because the 22nd Psalm is uh, these are words spoken in his heart while he's hanging on the tree dying for you and me. Psalm 59 verse 6 says, They return at evening. They make a noise like a dog and go round about the city. This is the growling that comes from the dogs. Are there, is there any growling in this culture today? Do you see any, any out here in America that may fit the category of being a dog? Are there any Christ haters out there? Are there any God haters out there? You better believe that. And we're coming near, more near by the day. Isaiah chapter 56 and verse number 11 says, Yea, they are greedy dogs which can never have enough. They are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way, every one, for his gain from his quarter. So that the word of God from Genesis through Revelation never has anything good to say about a dog. We find when David confronted Goliath or Goliath confronted David, whichever way you want to put it, and here's a child, a boy, a mere boy that's coming before this huge man, probably 9 to 13 feet tall. Who knows exactly? But Goliath was a giant, Goliath of Gath. And he looked down at this little shepherd boy and here's what he said. Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? In other words, he said, you show me no respect. I am the champion of the Philistine. Look at me. Who are you, David, to come to see? You're not worthy to be an opponent. And the Bible said he cursed him by his gods. I'm sure there's a lot of that going on today. I'm sure there's a lot of cursing going on this morning. When they're cursing church people and they're saying, Who are you to go to the house of God? And you might be, in, you might be infecting others around you. Well, there's really no difference than this in Walmart. Amen. Amen. Philistine cursed by his God. In the book of 2 Samuel chapter 9 verse number 8. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon a dog such as I? Do you know who said that? Mephibosheth did. Mephibosheth saw himself. He was humbled. He'd, his, his, his caretaker had dropped him when he was a child. And he, and he was hurt in his feet and he couldn't walk. And he lived in Lodibar. And David being the kind of man that he was. Gracious. And he poured out his soul. And he said, is there any left of the house of Saul? That I might show mercy for Jonathan's sake. I love Jonathan. And so there is one, they said, and it's Mephibosheth. And here's how he saw himself, a dog like me. Who are you to call me into your house? Who am I to sit at the king's table? I was a dog. Well, let me tell you something. I'm not worthy to sit at the king's table. But he made me worthy by the grace of God. You understand that? That's the difference between self-righteousness and the grace of God. I am not good enough for anything. But he makes me good. Because I have his grace 
applied to my soul. Thanks be unto God. I know where I came from. Second Samuel chapter 16 verse 9. Then said Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, to the king, Why shouldest this dead dog curse my Lord? And Shemaiah was cursing David as he was crossing the Kidron Valley. His son Abishalom, Absalom, had taken over the throne. And sedition had cast David aside and David was weeping and he was leaving. I mean, not only was he losing the kingdom for the time, it was his own son doing it. And what his son was doing on top of the housetops. Go home and read that. What a shame. And David had to bear all of that and he went across with his head down. And this man gets up and he curses him and curses him like a dog. And this man says, I'll take his head off. Isn't it good to know that there are those who still love Christ? That's what I sing about. That's why I preach. And that's why I live for him because I love him. He's never failed me. Everything I've ever learned about him has been good. Everything he's ever done for me has been good. He's a good God and a good Savior. Hallelujah to God. In every way possible. You pray, preacher, can't you find any fault in him? I've hunted high and low. I've checked him out since 1973. And I'm going to tell you right now, I find no fault in him. Amen. There is no Savior like him. Never man spake like this man. There's only one that can walk on the water. Just one that can raise the dead. And there's only one that can say to you, live. And life immediately comes into your soul. It's what happened to you when God saved you. He spoke to you and the power of the Holy Ghost of God birthed you, born you into the family of God. Amen. Born. Born. Amen. To be eaten by dogs was a sign of God's special curse. You see, first of all, we lay down the foundation. Dogs are bad. Dogs are filthy. Dogs are ungodly. So to be eaten by dogs is the worst thing that could happen to someone. We read over there where God prophesied because of Naboth that the dogs would lick the blood of Ahab, and so they did. And then the prophet prophesied that the dogs would eat Jezebel, and so they did. And the only thing they left of Jezebel when they went back out to find her body was the top of her head, her feet, and her hands. The head that concocted all of that wickedness. The hands that set about to do it and the feet that carried her there. To Jezebel was one of the most wicked people in the whole Bible. In all the scripture, Jezebel, did you know she's mentioned in the book of Revelation? Jezebel shows up over there and she's deceiving God's people. She's trying to deceive. She still deceives. She, listen, her counterpart is riding that beast in the book of Revelation chapter number 14. And so we have Jezebel to be eaten by the dogs. Now in the book of Romans, chapter number 1, verse 24, follow me now as we come down to this. Romans 1, 24. Wherefore God also gave them up into uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. And they changed the truth of God into a lie. What is the truth of God? Bara. Speak. It comes into existence. When God spoke all of the creation into existence, He didn't speak in a little pebble that would grow into what it is. He spoke living things. He spoke creation. It had age when He spoke it and brought it into existence. This is the mighty Creator God. He said, who is with me when I created all of this? Who did I take counsel with? He said in the book of Job. There wasn't anybody to take counsel with. There wasn't anybody there. And then when he made the earth, the Bible said the sons of God shouted when he brought the earth into existence. This blue thing that we're on right now, beautiful. The problem is, once you get closer to it, it begins to lose its beauty, doesn't it? I mean, it's beautiful from space, but once you get down here where we are, it's lost a lot of its beauty. <laughs> How many of you agree with that? He spoke it into existence. Praise be unto God. Well, the Bible says over here that they changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. For this cause, God gave them up into vile affections. This is what the Bible has to say about it. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. 
And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust, one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. Did you know when the HIV virus came out back in the 70s, they called it GRID, gay-related immunodeficiency? They changed it to uh, HIV because it was not less descriptive of a certain group. And it was a virus, and it was a virus that was killing people, but back then it was only killing a certain group of people. That's right. When that virus first came out, it was only killing a certain group of people. Then another virus, H1N1, followed in. Then the swine flu followed in. And another virus followed that one. And now finally we've had a virus that's come out that it belongs to SARS, which it has to do with your respiratory system. But it appears with what they're saying, it's a whole new virus. And this is what's brought the world to its knees. This is why you're in here this morning and they're tracking where you're going. In the year 2001, Muslims destroyed two trade towers in New York City. Two of them. Two of them. Over 3,000 people died. One of the saddest things you ever saw in your life is to see those people as they jump from those buildings. It's horrible. Horrible beyond belief. But do you judge a tree by the fruit it bears? Always judge it by what comes of it. What came of it? The Patriot Act came of it. What was that? That's the initial stages of controlling and observing who you are and where you go. A lot of other issues came of it, but that one in particular is something you need to be concerned about today. Because now, a man by the name of Bobby Rush, he's an Illinois Democrat, that he has, uh, he has presented a House resolution that would put big government in charge of tracking citizens' movements as they relate to COVID-19. I read this from the Washington Times, not from Hey Boy Scuttlebutt Corner, but from the Washington Times. <laughs> if you're in the Navy, you know what a scuttlebutt is. <laughs> that would put big government in charge of tracking citizens' movements as they relate to COVID-19 mitigation efforts. Even sending health bureaucrats to individuals' residences as necessary. As the legislation states, it has a most apt number, 6666. Six, six, six. Look at all those sixes. What do you think about that? Do you think something is going on here? Do you believe that somebody is, is making another step now to control you? And observe you and watch every move you make. The Bible says over here about these people. Go back and look at it for a moment. In verse number 28, Romans 1. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. The Greek word for reprobate is a dokimos. You go look it up in the Greek lexicon. It simply means unable to discern. The Bible says in the last days they'll call evil good and good evil. That's a dokimos. They're, they're, they're in your face with it. They're saying, this is what you should accept. This is the new normal. <laughs> Have you heard that one lately? And part of the new normal is the culture. We've been in culture wars, they say now, for decades. And I'll tell you from what I see, it looks to me like the dogs and the swine are winning. So who are these people, preacher? Who are the dogs and the swine? Look at verse 32, Romans 1. Romans 1. This begins to give us a little idea of the difference between just a, a dirty, low-down, rotten, stinking sinner that we all were at one time. But we've been washed in the blood. We've been cleansed. We've been saved. We're not that anymore. But here's a crowd that's different. This bunch is different. Romans 1, 32, who knowing the judgment of God, so they can't plead ignorance. That they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do it, but look at this. They take pleasure in them that do it. That's arrogance. That's, that's standing in the face of God. That's saying to him, you don't even exist. If you do exist, I'm going to do my thing. Because my God is greater than your God. 
They're teaching people today that the Christian God is just one more God. It is our, it is our faith tradition. Have you noticed how now that everybody's being categorized as faith? The faith community. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed how that they're putting Christians and Muslims and Hindus and all together in the same unit? Well, let me tell you something. The Lord Jesus Christ does not join with anybody's unit. When Peter, when Peter, when Peter and, and, and James and the Lord Jesus and John, the Lord Jesus on top of the Mount of Transfiguration, let us make three tabernacles. And the voice from heaven said, hold on, boys. <laughs> just, I know you mean well, but there's just one name that's above every name. I'll not join it, folks. I'm not, part of the, I'm not part of the faith tradition. I'm not part of the faith community. This is the church of God. There is no other church. And all of his bodies are all over this world. Many, 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 many faithful churches out here. People that love the Lord. That's his body. And that's what we belong to. And the faith community is a, is a, it's a, it's a fabrication. And why do they do that? They do that so they can lump you together and get you to become ecumenical. They want to make an ecumenical religion for the last days. That's what's happening. These are reprobates. They have no, they cannot repent. They crossed a line to where now they're taking pleasure. They march through the streets. They celebrate sodomy. More and more and more of the companies, big companies in this country now, are accommodating them in their advertisements. You look under, you turn your television set on, and you got two men kissing. You got two women kissing. And little kids, look at this, little children. They see this stuff. It's come a long way from when it came on at 5 o'clock in the afternoon and it had a round circle. And it was on from 5 o'clock in the afternoon until I don't know what it was, 10 or 11, 12 o'clock at night. And it was the Lone Ranger and it was the Shadow and it was stuff like that. And, it, and, it, and, and, and watch my line and just simple entertainment. It's a long way from that today. It's gotten to the point today that you better be very careful if you've got a television in your house. Because you've got something that could be very wicked. You've got to be careful today with what you're dealing with. So the Bible says that they are, that they take pleasure. Now we're seeing the dog. Now we're beginning to see him. Now watch. All over this country we have governors. I don't know why, that it's not so obvious. You've got blue states and red states. A red state, Republican. Blue state, Democrat. You mean the Republicans are good and the Democrats are bad? No, sirree. The sovereignty of this nation has been on the block for 30 to 40 years. The sovereignty of America has been sold to a globalist economy and the Republicans were just as much a part of it as the Democrats. You got to get a hold of that. Just as guilty. Just as guilty. But there's something happening now. And I want you to watch this. There's something happening. The blue state governors don't want to let the people come in like we are here. This is Tennessee, folks. I mean, everybody can't meet like this. The red state governors are trying to open up their states. So what's going on? Politics. They're fighting and people are dying for the next president of the United States. How many of you saw what Trump did just two or three days ago? Trump got up in front of the camera, only zoned up for a minute or so. And he says to all of the governors of the, of the United States, he says, it's time to open up the churches. I read yesterday about a gay bar, liquor store, Marijuana store and the big boxes are all open and have been open, but they're shutting the churches down. Are you seeing the dog? They're shutting the churches down, but all that junk is open. So he says, we're going to open up all the churches in this country and synagogues and, uh, and uh, mosques. And we're going we're gonna to open them up because it, people should have a right to come and worship God. 
should have a right. Stay tuned. See what he runs up against now in the next few days. You're going to find out who the God haters are. You're going to find out. I am so encouraged. My heart is. It is. I am so encouraged by all these faces in here this morning. I really am. Because there's a hunger in your face. How many of you are just sick and tired of Caesar locking you in your house and telling you you can't go anywhere? While you watch this crowd out here go everywhere and you can't go to church. You're sick and tired of it, aren't you? Well, let me tell you something. The Lord Jesus is coming back for his bride. He's coming for his bride. And for those that look for him, shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. His bride will be looking for him. We're looking up. We're not looking out. We're looking up. And I'm honest with you. There's too many stuff, too much stuff happening today for me to just stick my head in the sand. We got some stuff going on here. And there's more and more and more than what I gave you this morning. I was trying to lay out a simple scenario for you. We got dogs and we got swine out there. They hate you, they hate God, and they hate Christ. And they'll do anything they can to squeeze the very life out of the church and try to do it. But look at you. <laughs> Let me tell you something, Caesar. You start persecuting the church of God and you'll create a revival like you've never seen before. It always happens. It always happens. Persecution brings on revivals, real revivals. And I think some of them are smart enough to know that. This is not Russia. This is not China. We got a constitution. We got enough people in this country that never darken a church door, but they still respect the constitution. It won't be happy to shut the church. It won't be easy to shut the church down in this country. God bless you. God bless you for coming. God bless you. Don't let him push you around. Don't let him shut you down. Don't let him do it again. Take what that president said. We're opening them up. And he said, even if we have a second wave of this stuff, churches stay open. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise be unto God. Father, in Jesus' name, I've delivered my soul, Father. I, I preach what you put on my heart. I don't hate anybody, Lord. Don't hate them. I feel sorry for those people out there that have turned you off and turned you away. And they've made their choice. And now they're, they're, they're Christ haters and God haters. I feel sorry for them because they're only going to be here so long. Then they're going to go out into eternity. Man, what they're going to face. I pray for the folks in the house this morning heard the preaching. If there's anybody in here today that are, that's unsaved, the Lord, it would be a good time. It would be a wonderful day. If they could come down here and call on the name of the Lord. You said, for whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord. Whosoever. Isn't that a wonderful word? Whosoever. <laughs> Red man, yellow man, black man, white man, rich man, free man, bond man, pure man. What difference? He's, you can come. And I pray in Jesus' name. And for Jesus' sake.